I'm Cash. The name of the movie was One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. So, uh, some of the points. Uh, so, um, let's get to the criticism because Tayaz was the only one who mentioned that and uh, the difference was quite right also because uh, yeah, I've seen all Milos Forman movies kind of as kind of a fan and I can also see that difference. However, I can pass it to Parisa's answer because that's the way I saw it too. Because in all the examples that Tayaz mentioned, they were based on real life biographies of people. Mozart, Andy Kaufman, even Larry Flint. But this one was a parable. So um, I kind of agree with Parisa's answer, especially when you read the book. It's all mumbo jumbo symbolism. And actually, it's more realistic than what you read in the book. The book is certainly a parable. So it's, it goes more with the anti-establishment <coughs> messages that you go in. It. So certainly like that in the book. And the time period, which I'm going to talk about in the presentation. And um, yeah, funny that Amir mentioned the movie is successful in, in combining certain elements. Actually, in the book, again, another thing deleted from the movie is that in the book, the system is called combine. That's the name of the governmental system. So whenever they talk about the power structure, they call it combined. Uh, so just um, that, that's interesting. And um, yeah, another thing about laughing and crying, maybe Nassim mentioned it, right? And actually, that's, that's, that's the point that so many people talk about. And they say we don't know whether to laugh or cry when we, when we watch One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And maybe that's one of its strengths. And, or another thing that maybe I kind of agree with Tayaz is the question of form because I was also, I wasn't that sure about whether it's the right selection, but I thank Tadi for doing that because I don't know, maybe he did it for me because I said <laughs> this is one of my favorite movies, so please don't blame Hadi for that. And, um, but yeah, you know, I'm the content guy, so I try to be as formal as possible. I usually do it by the gut. So, <laughs> okay, that actually. Yeah, took some pressure off my shoulders. So. <laughs> and then, uh, but maybe what he can help us with yeah, more sure. formal aspects. Now on his shoulder. Yeah, yeah now no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's the bug. Uh, oh, the thing about the race, uh, before I forget. Yeah, the racial structure. Yeah, I looked at it as a kind of a symbolic thing. Because especially in the work, it's just the whites are the good guys, the blacks are the bad guys. It wasn't really a racial thing. So in the book, you know, it's just more about that. Because if it was racial, then you have the, you have the chief who is not red-haired, white American. Because McMurphy in the book is red-haired. So Jack Nicholson has dark hair, but McMurphy is red, red, freckled, and all that. And one point in the book, it mentions that McMurphy symbolizes red, white, blue American. Red in the hair, white on the skin, and blue color. So nothing could be more American than Mac Murphy there. Well, as a kind of a rebellious hero, but you had Chief, another great character. And also there is a Japanese nurse in the book. You could see her somewhere in the background, wasn't that much highlighted, who is very kind, the Japanese nurse. Like almost the opposite of Miss Ratchet. So I don't see that black and white as a racial thing. It's probably that symbolic, symbolic aspect of it. Um, Another thing was that, yeah, somebody mentioned Kubrick, maybe, no? Did I hear that right? No? <laughs> or something similar? I, I thought that the director is Kubrick. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay, you thought that the director is Kubrick. Yeah, and they say that this is one of the most famous non-Kubrick, Kubrickian films. <laughs> yeah, it's not going, yeah, so many people think so, right? So, and, um, yeah, that, and. Yeah, about the ending, I have it, so I will cover it later, so we keep it as the suspense of it. Uh, <laughs> that will be almost the end of it. All right, so let's go for it. Okay. So, one flew east, one flew west, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. That's a nursery rhyme, so the title comes from that, and uh, cuckoo as, well as a slang term can refer to crazy people. Whether we should call them crazy or not, which Sabro mentioned, is a good point, of course. And uh, Mac Murphy in the movie mentioned that you are not crazy, you're better than most of the guys who are there. Um, but as a title. So, um, something about the clip about form and content, maybe you noticed it in the movie. So. 
in, in, in terms of the human relationships, the juxtaposition of one person to another, the form, the content. Oh, they wanted you to knock off the bullshit and get to the point. This is the point. This is the point, Tabor. It's not bullshit. I'm not just talking about my wife. I'm talking about my life. I can't seem to get that through to you. I'm not just talking about one person. I'm talking about everybody. I'm talking about form. I'm talking about content. I'm talking about interrelationships. I'm talking about God, the devil, hell, heaven. Do you understand? Finally! <laughs> yeah. So, okay, that, that sums it up to some extent. Because usually my presentations are not about one aspect. So, <laughs> if it's to some extent content, please forgive me, in this season. But what does it mean to me, One Flew Over Cuckoo's Nest? Well, it's based on a book by Ken Kesey, a classic book. Um, so I usually, literature-wise, I followed my father. So like, he always had recommendations. He was a university lecturer. I always tried to catch up. And this is one of his favorite books. And another thing that he did which was interesting was that he used to also be uh, in, in, in human resources. Of, of a company, and one of the questions that famously he asked people was, what do you think about one floor or the cuckoo's nest? And uh, so several people who were interviewed by him always asked me, why does your father do that when it comes to humanity part of the interview? Right, so for him it was like <laughs> the most challenging thing to talk about after the formal questions of like, how old are you, what's your education and stuff. He asked, okay, so you watch movies? Have you seen One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? What do you think about that? So therefore, uh, it has a special place in, in my heart other than the fact that uh, like, I like it. So Ken Kesey, who was Ken Kesey? He comes from psychedelic 60s. And relating it to the subject of drug that was never ending in my season, if you remember. So it's a good question by, uh, good, good quotation by Ken Kesey, who was so much into drugs, and he said that. And this is his boss, which is very famous, called Further, you see the name there. He's a psychedelic magic boss, so they just travel around America um, doing drugs and experimenting and all of the sort of things. Um, he wasn't a hippie, he wasn't a beat, because the beats were before hippies, uh, some poets and writers, uh, because well, he was younger than the Beats and older than the hippies, as he put it. So he called himself and his movement Merry Pranksters. So Ken Kesey and Merry Pranksters were very famous at that time. It was like, it wasn't 50s anymore, it was still not the Woodstock area. So it, it, it fills that gap historically. Yes. yes. Um, so then Kerry Douglas. <laughs> found out about the book before it was even published. So 19, 1962, the book was published. Kirk Douglas bought the rights to filming or any kind of performance of the book in 1961, means a year before anybody even knew what is One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And then right after his publication, he took it to Broadway, and he played the role of Mac Murphy in New York City for about a year, probably. It wasn't that successful as a play. It was so-so because it was very controversial. Uh, so, somebody turned it into De Dale Wasserman. It's the name of the playwright. Turned it into a three-act play. Uh, but he was always dreaming of, dreaming of turning it into a movie. Then, so how did it turn out to be a movie? So it's all a collaboration of, to quote from the book, there is, there, there is a part of the book that says it's all the, the story kind of, it's all a collaboration. I guess Harding says it, the, the kind of intellectual crazy guy, mustache guy. This, this is a sentence by Harding, it says, it's all a collaboration of Kafka, Mark Twain, <laughs> and Martini. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and then, quite interestingly, when you, when you see the formation of the movie, you see these elements. Because Kafka is from the Czech Republic, and so is Milos Forman. Mark Twain, you clearly can see the American hero, Tom Sawyer type of hero there, who is Mac Murphy. And Martini, which is the funny part of this sentence, can refer to the whole brilliant cast that some of you mentioned. Like the actors are just wonderful. Danny DeVito like, just lived with the role to some extent, they said. that. 
Like he couldn't even come out of it. And he, he played it in the theater too, not in the 60s version, in the 70s version, before the movie anyway. So he, Martini, that interview was one of the first who, who actually was selected to play the role of Martini because he did it off-Broadway in a, in a theater owned by Francis Ford Coppola, interestingly. And then, um, so, this is the gang behind it. That's Miller Foreman there in the center. You see Michael Douglas, because Kirk Douglas was, uh, couldn't handle the situation anymore. It took him so long. And then um, there's Saul Zainz, the, the producer, legendary producer, who was also, I guess, behind the English patient. Uh, another Oscar uh, The thing is that Kirk Douglas wanted to be the producer of the movie. He found Milos Forman, and he wanted Milos Forman to direct it in to direct it in a kind of a European way, interestingly. And then he told Milos Forman that I will send you the book. Milos Forman was still living in the Czech Republic. He sent him the book, but at the customs of the Czech Republic, they held the book and didn't send it to Milos Forman's house. And Milos Forman thought that Kirk Douglas forgot about it. And after 10 years, they met each other in, in some film festival. And Milos Forman told him what happened to the book. And Kirk Douglas said, exactly, what happened to the book? So they found out that actually he didn't even read it. So the, the project started again. Kirk Douglas was busy handing it to Michael Douglas, his son, and Saul Zings. Now, why do I mention the producer? Because they were so much involved in, in what you saw. Uh, so although Milos Forman is pretty famous, but at that time, probably he wasn't that much in control of the situation and the book was a cult book so many people wanted to have a say even Jack Nicholson had a lot of ideas that wanted in the movie so that was that's why it was a collaboration totally it was a teamwork it's not that it's not a typical Milos Forman movie maybe I mean it's it's good we enjoyed it but maybe uh, it's not that, as Ty has also mentioned it's we, we can't put it in the same category as Mozart or like later films of Milos Um So another link was that well, about Saul Zainz. I want I want I want to link Saul Zainz to this photo. Saul Zainz on the right was was sometimes famous for just being a businessman, which is totally not so. Because one thing that you may not know is that the, before being a film producer, what Saul Zainz said did was being a producer for Rebel poets and folk singers of early 60s, like Dylan, and that's Michael McClure on the other side, and Allen Ginsberg on the other side. So these, these were all rebel poets of San Francisco, and they were going to Saul Zainz's studio to record their anti-establishment material. So he comes from that kind of background, which is totally in sync with this type of movie. Now, the, the Book specifically has a, has a lot of like folk kind of touch to it, which is more Bob Dylan-esque, and, and the kind of lyrical poetry inside it. So there's a touch of folk there too, like it's country, it's folk, it's rebellious, it's anti-establishment, it's Czech because of the Milos Forman influence on it. Now like, here's a song, it, it gets repeated a lot in the book, I just want to, wanted to mention it because it sums everything up. It's a traditional folk song. And Mac Murphy sings it. So I thought we can give a part of it a go. It's longer than that. Yeah. But uh, yeah. just to get a bit multimedia. Uh, my screen just popped up on the way. Yeah. Well, I guess I can manage with three screens. <laughs> Mac Murphy thinks that it's just pretty much like his own story, as you can see. The lines will tell. I'm a rambler, I'm a gambler, I'm a long way from my home. Many people don't like me, they can leave. had a lover, her age was 16, she's a flower of the bed, and the rose 
dreams of Celine. There's changes in the ocean. There's changes in the sea. There's changes in my true love. And we're changing me. I'm a rambler. I'm a gambler. Thank you. <laughs> More like the Mark Twain side of it, because you see, see such passages of people singing the story in, in Huckleberry Finn or like that kind of stuff on the road, some classic Americana. And then the Czech side of it, the guys, the producers, Kirk Douglas and later Saul Zanz and Michael Douglas, insisted on having Miller Sherman specifically because this film of his caught their attention. The Fireman's Ball, which is so claustrophobic, the whole film again happens within the walls. And he, they, they saw that he has the potential to use those kinds of skills, bring it to this type of a story. However, it, it caused so many changes. That made it more realistic. Miller Forman wanted more European than psychedelic, like being high all the time. And like, like in, in the book, Chief is the narrator, Chief is the main character. Mac Murphy is the other guy, so you always see Mac Murphy through the eyes of the chief. So he changed that. That was one thing. And um, yeah, he, he just wanted everything to be real because he said, as, as, as you also mentioned, Mel Sherman said, this reminds me of a government. This reminds me of some kind of very wrongly oppressive government, such as the one that I saw in, in the Czech, Czechoslovakia at the time. And so I wanted it to be that way, like symbolic, with, with that kind of oppressive meaning. And Miller Sherman always asked the actors to play it real, do it real. And said, no bullshit, no bullshit, no bullshit stage drama. That's the famous thing that he always told. <laughs> right? Just bring it to life, be real, be, be believable. Let's like carry the message. So that's why some people call it like, although it's American pretty much, it's also Czech. So it's Check in Mary. So as I said, there are so many links to it. Like, so the second time they performed it successfully was at Francis Ford Coppola's theater. I just want to mention as a fun trivia, right? So Coppola was behind it too. Now, the cast, the, the martini part of uh, those three things that we mentioned. So we covered Kafka, Martin, and for the martini, let's talk about all of them. So the interesting thing about this, this fabulous cast is that when you read the book, or when you see so many movies as we, you, you see that sometimes we just get lost. We don't know who is who. Which character did that, who did that, like the Japanese movie that we saw like a couple of weeks ago maybe. Brilliant movie. Well, one of our problems was that sometimes we didn't know who is who and what did they do like two scenes before that or this. So here it was clear, because you have a very clear picture of the faces, even better than the book, although so many people prefer the book. But here it's quite clear who is who. In the book, sometimes you have to go back like 10 pages, 20 pages, and find out who was Fredrickson. But when you see Fredrickson, I mean, that kind of face, just, it's just there, or Harding even, although he's pretty much intellect, intellectual in the book too. He's the only one who gives all those Freudian talks and things in the book. Sometimes you just for, forget, like Harding, who? Who was Harding? You have to go back because there's so many characters. In the book there are more even, more mental patients. Uh, but here you don't miss that. That's the thing that Miller Schwerman wanted. They, they want each face to be very, very specific. It kind of refers to Ken Kesey's sketches too. If you look at the special edition of the book, Ken Kesey has the sketches all over it and shows you the faces of the characters. I'm using the book, I'm doing the old-fashioned thing just to defend my friend who once did it and got criticized for six months. Uh, so didn't want to put it on the board. So yeah, these sketches are all some sort of crazy faces and you see these faces on the faces of these actors. It's brilliant. So he got them from the sketches done by Ken Kesey. 
Uh, so there's a lot to talk about, about the characters. We can, we can do it later, maybe. I might run horribly out of time. Um, yeah, just, just one thing that Dr. Spivey wasn't really an actor. He was the only one who was actually the doctor of the hospital <laughs> that they filmed the movie in. Uh, well, another thing maybe about the form, which is interesting, is that they filmed it in the hospital, in an actual hospital. The ceiling was low, and they couldn't have the natural lighting that you would have in a Hollywood studio. So it was pretty tough on the cinematographers, and they hated Milo Shorma for that, because they had to like, use so many weird spaces for actually giving it the light. And also the hospital was in Oregon. Oregon is famous for being cloudy and dark all the time. So they had to give all this sort of artificial light and making it look like it's real. Uh, so that was the interesting thing about the hospital, but they wanted the hospital environment. Well, and another thing is that the, the actors lived in the hospital for two weeks before the actual shooting. They lived in the hospital exactly like the mental patients. They lived together. And this Dr. Spivey, because he was there himself, he told him that, okay, Martini, your character is similar to that guy. Just follow him. Be with him for two weeks and imitate whatever it is he's doing. You don't need to know what his problem is. Just, just, just imitate his movements. Because as a doctor, I can't tell you like the secrets. So you can't go deep, but just look at him. That's you, like Fredrickson. That's you, right? So if, if, if they get, they get each one of them somebody to live with and imitate for a couple of weeks. Uh, Cheswick got into the role so much that they had to give him pills sometimes to calm him down. Because <laughs> he would cry and shout and like totally out of control. Okay. Um, so it was one hell of a behind the scenes. And oh, another, another real thing that happened might be again interesting for Hadi because it comes close to that breaking the teeth in the, in the Japanese movie. Is that Harding, actually, they discovered that Harding, the intellectual guy, during the filming, they discovered that he had leukemia. And they knew that he will die by the end of the movie, maybe even in the middle of the shooting, but he continued. And it's funny that the movie was mostly filmed in sequence. And if you remember, in one of the last scenes, when Billy comes out victoriously and all that, there is a scene when Harding is playing the bongo drums so happily. And he knew that like, in a couple of months, he's going to die. So that was like great acting in, in, under, under such situation. Christopher Lloyd as Taylor was in theater. And um, yeah, another interesting was the nurse Ratchet, who got the Oscars. She was the only one who had to insist on getting the role. And Miller Schwarman several times rejected her. Like, like, this role is not for you. But he, he, I guess she came to auditions like for several months. Until he said, okay, you know what, maybe, 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 maybe we should have a good looking character who is actually tamed by the system. And she thinks that she's right. She's not really evil. So she's just a representative. So why not? So let, let's, let's have her with a, with a beautiful face. And also in the book, Nurse Ratchet is not ugly. So there are several points that uh, mention it. So it's kind of similar to the character in the book. All right, so Shawshank Redemption, Parisa mentioned it quite right. So, so many people say that. There are tons of movies inspired by One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. That, that's one of them. Another one that I know has a strong fan base is Fight Club. And there are so many others. So the movies that this one inspired, because like in case of Tarantino, we were talking about who inspired Tarantino. So I thought, okay, let's do the opposite in this case. Now then, we have this guy, because uh, some of you, I guess, talked about the music. Art Garfunkel was kind of behind that. He was a member of Simon and Garfunkel. They were the first who, who made rock music literary, like they actually had meaningful lyrics. They were friends with the members of Pink Floyd before there was any Pink Floyd. Mm -hmm. And for a while, they lived in London. They could be even members of Pink Floyd. I know in Iran, we're mostly familiar with that band. But imagine that Simon and Garfunkel, this guy, were of that kind of caliber in terms of lyrics, just more folksy in, in terms of style. And Garfunkel introduced Jack Nietzsche, interesting surname, or a philosophical film. 
Jack Nietzsche was the musician behind that kind of music. And um, yeah, we, we're going to listen to the music a bit and that ending scene. If you be patient a little bit with that. Because look at how, just focus on the music and how it, it, it has that kind of like chilling effect on you. Just, just the music alone. I, I know the cinematography is great. Chief is great here. By the way, Chief wasn't an actor also, but was an artist, was a paint, painter, I guess. So here, if, if, you, if you follow the tones, what, what Jack Nietzsche on the music is doing to you is that he's using glass harmonicas. Right, so there's like these glasses, each one with a certain note, right? And also he's using a saw, an actual saw, a carpenter saw, right? With, 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 with the fiddle of a violin on it. And then some drums, like, like Indian type of drums, a little bit of flute or pipe here or there, and builds it up to some orchestra, and then bring it, brings it up, up and down. Just, just, just focus on that. And, and also to appreciate the, 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 the end credits that I always like to watch and encourage <laughs> other people to do so, because they just leave you there listening to the music, looking at some names, but you're still digesting the thoughts in the movie. And when the music is that great, it shouldn't be missed. Still you just have the glass harmonica and the saw with the drums. Now as the scene gets epic, it gets more orchestral. Now, a little bit of brass back there. subconscious level on you, like at that moment you're not thinking about music clearly, but they're working on you, they're just wired to you kind of. And then even when it ends, you have that screaming magical sound that is not normal. Who listens to glass harmonica and so like a, on a regular basis? So it keeps you there thinking. And while, while it's going, so what's, what's going to happen in the end? In the book, it's darker. It's much darker because Chief sees a dog in the same field running towards a kind of highway, and the dog gets killed by a car, which symbolizes machinery. And then when it comes to this part in the book, you know that it's going to happen to Chief too. He, can, he, can, he cannot resist all, 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 all this Kafkaesque system that we've developed. But at least he tried, as Mac Murphy put it. So there's that element of like uh, courage and try and doing something, not, not giving up in it. So it's not like totally 
happy ending even for chief in the book. Now here, but it's more open to interpretation. You might consider it a happy one. Some produce, I guess, uh, some other producers wanted Saul Zanz to make it a totally happy ending, like even letting Mac Murphy leave. And so, somebody mentioned that that would be a horrible ending, in which I agree. Uh, Saul Zanz said no. I mean, Mac Murphy is going to die, but maybe under that sort of pressure, they thought, okay, let's just make the ending a bit more epic for Chief. It, it still works, I guess. Um, yeah, and, and I don't know what you think. We can discuss that. But it's, it's, it's a tad bit happier, the movie. What? Not as crappy as like Snows of Kilimanjaro, like some of you have seen the movie. I'm, I'm here saw so that. And, no, that was so horrible, like totally changing the ending. Like the movie was quite decent, Gary Peck and all that, but like the ending just ruined it. Uh, so it, it was decent enough. More cinematic for sure. Um, so we can discuss it some more. I have many points to mention, so later we can talk about it. I don't know, should I ask a question? Sure. Uh, we have.